Hello, everybody. Welcome to another MXGP virtual live studio show with me, Paul Malin, and Lisa Leyland. Today's guest will be Mitch Evans from Team HRC. Uh, hope you're all staying safe and well and enjoying coming out of lockdown uh, ever so slowly. But uh, before we meet our first guest, Lisa Leyland, um, down there in Spain, how are you? And um, how's that spare room looking, that guest bedroom? <laughs> uh, well, the guest bedroom still hasn't been used, funny enough. So, uh... Still Billy No Mates at home, but uh, no, it's fine. The restrictions are slowly lifting, like you said, and I think from next week we'll have further further restrictions lifted. So, so far, so good, yeah? Okay, no, because the only reason why I ask is because uh, next week we could be doing the studio show from Barcelona, you and, he, you and me, <laughs> because I think the wife and I are fed up of just being locked down in Belgium now. So we're going to drive the van down, bring the bicycles, <laughs> <laughs> take You're over Barcelona. Welcome. You're more than welcome to use our spare room, okay? Cool, yes. thanks. The invite is there, and All also right. for uh, Mitch as well. <laughs> uh, well, I tell you what, he's got a bit further he's to got, travel yeah, because exactly. <laughs> uh, he is the other side of the world today. And uh, Mitch Evans, teammate RC, uh, welcome to our virtual studio show. Uh, first of all, how are you and how is life down under? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Thanks for having me on. Uh, life down here is pretty good at the moment. Um, can't really complain. Uh, there's... I don't get to come home much um, since I've moved to Europe, so it's uh, it's really good to be home and not really have to be worrying about a schedule to go racing or doing training and whatnot. So it's good to be home, seeing family and friends, and just uh, enjoying things off the bike for a while. So not in a hurry um, to get back then. <laughs> yeah, honestly, mate, I am in no rush to get back racing. It's uh, it's like a very long holiday here, so it's good. Yeah. Brilliant. And of course, how was the party last night? I heard there was a small gathering going on, some tapas, a spread of food on a board, as you call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we had a little spread here to um, celebrate my girlfriend's sister's engagement. So mm -hmm. um, congratulations to them. And yeah, it was just a uh, quiet little night here. But um, yeah, it was good. What What did you buy the, uh, the couple? Uh, me? Uh, did not, know, did not really get them an engagement <laughs> gift. Did you not get them an engagement uh, gift? Uh, Jasmine. How was, rude. Um, it was a you know, <laughs> shared gift, so okay. nothing directly from me just yet. All right. <laughs> uh, well, more importantly, just tell us, how's uh, the recovery on the shoulder going? Yeah, really, really good, actually. Um, right from the start, all the everyone that I've seen the surgeon my physio and my team physio Filippo back in Italy has said I've had double the amount of range of motion than I normally should have um, right from the start and that's always been how it was and it kind of felt like I was you know at even after the six week mark I could almost like I thought it was the same as my other shoulder so they were telling me to stay calm stay calm make sure I didn't overuse it because that's when it, you could um, do more damage to it and it kind of got to the point where because I hadn't done any strength training on it or whatnot and I had a lot of range of motion and it, it started to feel really unstable because it just got so weak so um, about three or four weeks ago now I started doing strength training on it again and strengths come back really fast and um, yeah it's feeling like I could get back on the bike pretty soon. What did you actually do to it and is that the first time you've had problems with with shoulders that one in particular for instance yeah i've had a couple of issues with my left shoulder like in latvia last year and at riola this year just like a little jars to the shoulder and they come good after a couple of days um but yeah this was the first time dislocating a shoulder for me and i at first i didn't really know if it was dislocated or not i kind of tried to get back on the bike and then you know just the whole arm didn't work so i was like for sure something's wrong so I um yeah ended up just uh uh had a labrum tear and um the surgeon said to me look you can either get the surgery done now or you can keep racing and we get to the end of the season and do it then or do it if it's giving you no troubles you can do it at the end of your career or something but we thought with this lockdown we don't really know when we're going racing again so might as well get in and get it done now yeah, what actually happened actually? Because we never we never saw it on TV. Um, it was in the first race on Sunday, wasn't it, Valpens Wild? Yeah, first race on the first lap, and I I had a look on the um, the stream, and you can just see it in one picture. It's on that first downhill. Um, 
you know, after the top. I, I believe Tonus and Jonas come together at the bottom of that hill, just underneath yeah. the tunnel. Um, yeah, so at the top of that, I come together with Paul Ann in the air. And as we've landed, I've landed on his handlebars and it's shot me off to the left and I've ran straight into the back of uh, Chervelin and then just endo down the hill and landed straight on a braking bump on my mm. shoulder and rolled down the hill and, yeah, ended up walking back to the pits and that was the longest walk of my life. Yeah. <laughs> At least it felt like because I was in so much pain. Well, it seemed like quite a challenging weekend all around, really, didn't it? I mean, didn't you crash with Jacoby on the Saturday in the qualifying race as well? Yeah, well, actually, we didn't come together, but um, I crashed. And then as I was getting up, I heard a big panic rev and I turned around and he was on the ground too. So I was like, oh, hey, mate, what's going on? I thought we were <laughs> testing soil here. But yeah, I kind of struggled all weekend there. I think everyone was with the track and whatnot. And I just um, couldn't really gel with the track and i was feeling a little bit off all day so i was just thinking i just got to try and survive this weekend and didn't even make one lap so mm, well greatest. i mean it was such a contrast to the week before at matterley wasn't it i mean let's talk race one you were right up there at the sharp end you were challenging for that win yeah that was really good i got off to a great start in that motor and I really liked that track last year, but I struggled a little bit um, on the 250, being a little bit bigger. I struggled with the power, and it's a really fast, wide open track, and it's got some big jumps there. So I was really looking forward to getting there this year on the 450, and I just felt great. Um, we kind of had, you know, shortened scheduled there, but it kind of helped me out because I had a chest infection leading up to it. So I was a little bit under the weather, but. Um, by the second motto, I didn't feel that at all. So I struggled a little bit with that in the first motto, but um, I was really happy with my riding all weekend, um, especially I would have loved to have been on the podium. That was my ultimate goal, but um, we fell a little bit short, but I still couldn't, can't really complain with how that weekend went. Yeah, well, it was, you know, the dream start really, wasn't it, as a MXGP rookie? Um, I guess you had nothing to lose. Uh, even after winning a race in Italy in Mantova just uh, what, a couple of weeks earlier in one of those international races there. Um, yeah. But like I say, it couldn't have gone any better really with a start like this in the first race. Here you are challenging Jeffrey uh, for the lead, having just passed Jeremy Siwa. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those um, Italian races gave me really good confidence and just knowing that I could um, run that pace for a good portion of the race. Obviously, those races are a little bit um, shorter than what the GPs are, but um, yeah, leading into it, I knew that I could run that pace for the whole moto and that I even had the pace to start off with. So that was uh, really cool. And Honestly, my riding in the first motor wasn't that good, but in the second motor, it was really good. It's just a shame that I spun up on the gate and had to come from dead last. Yeah, well, let's talk about race two then, um, because it wasn't as straightforward. Um, you just mentioned it. I was about to say, you know, was it a bad start or did you get held up on the first lap, but you spun up on the grid? Um, did you also get held up on the, on the first lap as well or not? Nah, I just um, spun up on the grid. Just uh, we all weekend we were using a, a paddle tire, and we I decided for the last moto to use the um, thirty two tire, and we I was struggling at, on the test track to um, not make it spin off the gate, but I thought with how much the track was drying out that I needed to take the risk, and yeah, unfortunately spun up on the gate again, just one of those things that we couldn't work out so um but honestly i think like my riding in that moto and everyone everyone else said that that race was probably a lot better than the first race and i felt that as well so even though the result wasn't as good um i showed a lot more speed and i showed that i can actually come through the pack really fast so i was um definitely all smiles after that weekend well, like you said, you did seem determined to get back up at the front, though. This clip here sees you passing three riders in the space of six corners. I mean, I mean, you were on fire yeah. there. Yeah, pretty much from the gate drop until that moment, I was just kind of just wide open. I wasn't really using my head or anything. I was just 
like a little kid, like a rookie in their first year, just going wide open, not really using their brains at all. So I kind of got to that point. I think it was like almost halfway through the moto and I was like, oh man, all right, I need to calm down a bit. I need to actually focus <laughs> on my breathing because I just wasn't thinking about anything else. And I was taking some pretty big risks too. So, um, but it was I, like, I felt really comfortable on the bike. And actually, when you're in those races, sometimes, you know, with the performance that you put in, you got back to seventh. And sometimes that can be just as satisfying as the third that you got in race one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, that's what I mean. Like, I think last year there, that race or that round was, it was kind of the same deal because I was almost a lap down and then. You know, I pulled out in front of the leaders and they weren't really catching me. So that, um, you know, showed everyone that I do have the pace to run up the front. And also, again, even though it wasn't the best result, I was still able to show some sort of potential and that I can actually make something happen when, when things are going bad. Yeah. How beneficial has it been having Tim Geiser, uh, the defending world champion, as your teammate? Because presumably you would have spent a bit of time testing with him and riding with him and um, chasing him around the track during the off-season. And obviously you beat him in Mantua in that one race. Yeah, so it's really good. I mean, for the testing side of things, we don't really help each other that much because the way we set up bikes are completely different. So, But just to go riding with him and watch him ride and you know see his lap times and compare them to mine, I kind of knew that I was around the same sort of speed, so that was um, definitely a confidence booster. And just, I was just focusing on needing to improve my fitness a little bit to, um, you know, survive on that big bike. So it's also cool to see what sort of training he does because at the time I was just doing all the training by, like by myself and doing my own programs. So um, it was cool to get some ideas, and because he's probably one of the fittest guys in the paddock, so. Um, it was, he's, um, definitely, definitely one of the right people to learn off. How was the, uh, Australian lessons? We had him on the studio <laughs> show a couple of weeks ago and, uh, we tried to, cause I know the videographer, uh, Gary Redeye, who, uh, shot some stuff for you this year. And obviously I saw you, uh, trying to teach him Australian. We asked him to try and live. Yeah. It was like, no, 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 no. So yeah. <laughs> you, you, you seem like you get on very well. Yeah, we do. I mean, Tim. I'm, I think Tim gets along with anyone, you know, he's one mm. of the, the nicest guys in the paddock. So for me, I find him, he's a little bit more quiet and I kind of like to have a good time and joke around and, you know, <laughs> um, pay out on people kind of thing. So I've been, you know, even though he's the world champ, you wouldn't really know because I kind of just don't really give him that much respect of being world champ, you know, I kind of <laughs> just... Uh, tell him that I'm going to beat him and, and whatnot. So, uh, <laughs> but he's pretty cool with how he takes it. And yeah, we get along really well and we have a good time. A little bit of Aussie humor, a little bit of jibbing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't really care who you are and hopefully one day I'll beat you. So that's, yeah. the, way I look that's, at it. that's the attitude to have. Um, well, actually last year in MX2, you managed to get on the podium in Argentina and Portugal. After your yep. performance in Matali, were you thinking, right, actually more visits to the box is possible now? Uh, after Madeley this year? Yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, that was kind of my goal for this year was to be top five overall and to, be, to get a couple of podiums like I did last year. And even after the Italian championship rounds, I kind of felt like that was um, going to be achievable. And to come really close to it at Madeley Basin was just even more of a confidence booster. So, unfortunately, yeah, the season's being put on hold. But hopefully we can get back and we can pick up right where we left off. You just mentioned in uh, a few moments ago about your shoulder and your rehab and everything else. How far do you think you are from 100% at the moment with it in terms of your range of movement? I know you're working on strength at the moment. But could you sort of say you'd be back on a bike in two months, three months. What's the rough kind of, you know, estimate? Yeah, so like with range of motion, I, I 
pretty much am almost back to 100%. Um, strength is still a little ways off. It feels really good in the gym, but I tried riding my push bike the other day and just the stability when I'm in that sort of position isn't the greatest. But last time I spoke to my surgeon, he said, yeah, at the three-month um, mark, we can start looking at um, riding again. And so that will be at the end of this month. So I'm planning on getting back on the bike then. But for the first month, he said it's just going to be really slow on flat track and whatnot, nothing too serious and just being really cautious with it. So I'm uh, counting down the days to the 23rd of June, that's for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, Mitch, we have uh, some questions on Facebook for you. Uh, The first one is from Andre Vegas or Burgess, who burns more clutches, you or Tim? (laughs) That's a pretty easy question, Andre. Um, It's definitely Tim. I I, Honestly, I can't believe how much he burns a clutch out. Every time we go testing or we do a moto, they got to change the clutch after every moto. Yeah, Maybe maybe they should put a factory clutch in there instead of those standard ones. They last longer. <laughs> well, I'm joking. Obviously, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even know what clutches we have in there, to be honest. So. Yeah, actually, Mitch. Mitch just uses one clutch per weekend. <laughs> I try to. Yeah. Hey, mate. Back in Australia, here when I was doing my own maintenance, I'd run 35 hours on one clutch. So I didn't want to change the clutch, so I just stopped using it. Could you change yeah. a clutch? I could. Take it out, but um, <laughs> that means no. Me. Uh, no. <laughs> All right, we'll just... Take it out, leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. I, I have done it a couple of times, but when I've been riding, I didn't really want to do any jumps because I wasn't that confident with how I put it back in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, we have another question for you, Mitch, on Facebook. Dudover P says mud, sand, or hard pack? Uh, honestly, I doesn't really matter for me, dude. Over P, so um, anything really, just as long as it's not like Vulcan Sword because um, they were pretty tough. So, um, yeah, doesn't really bother me as long as I get to ride my dirt bike. Ah. It was pretty heavy conditions there, actually, Vulcan Sword this year. I think the heaviest I've seen it in a long time. Yeah, and that's nothing I've ever experienced. That's for sure. No. Mm. No. Okay, um, we have another question. Valentin Seda, how old were you when you started riding? Um, I started riding when I was three for the first time. I remember my dad, my mum and dad always telling me the story when I first started riding. I, we lived on a hill and I came down the hill across the road into the next door neighbor's yard. And at the end of their yard was a massive drop off, and apparently I crashed <laughs> just before it. Thankfully, and thankfully there were no cars cross coming when I crossed the road too. And apparently I parked the bike up for a while then, and didn't really start riding for a, another half a year or so. So I'd say four years old I started riding. <laughs> that would have been scary, and the parents sort of saying just like, "Yeah, just go down the hill. Don't tell me where the brakes are." Don't tell me about look left or right before we cross the road. <laughs> Don't worry about the they, neighbor's garden. <laughs> they probably told me all of that, but I just whiskey throttle, you know, didn't, really, <laughs> didn't do anything about it. Okay. Uh, Theo Jackson, 2006. What inspired you to do motocross? Uh, what inspired me, Theo, was probably, um, I wouldn't say really inspired me, but my cousin, um, got a motorbike and um, yeah, Uncle Pete said to my mum and dad, oh, you should get the boys a bike to start riding. And at, at first, um, my brother and I shared a bike and um, yeah, we just rode around on grass fields for a while there. And then he was like, oh yeah, you guys should come and do a race. And we just started racing that way. And um, yeah, here we are now, like, I don't know, 16, 17 years later, still doing it. So. Okay. Uh, Tom Vandermast, who is your idol? Who's my idol? Um, That's probably a tough one, but in motocross, I'd probably say the person that I used to look up to the most was uh, like guys like Ricky Carmichael and um, Ryan Villapota. And in any other sports? And Paul Malin. 
Oh, shush. Sure, sure. yeah. He wasn't even probably <laughs> around when I was racing. <laughs> no, but to be honest, I, I never really followed the MXGP. So when I when I got to the GPs, the team, like especially last year, the team were like, oh, yeah, you, you're going to be racing. And they rattled off a heap of names. And I was like, I've never heard of these dudes before, but they must be yeah. pretty good. All right. <laughs> nothing personal, Paul. Nothing personal. I know. It's not. I, I won't take it personally. But across He's any other lose sports. Sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but across other sports, then, have you got any sporting idols, whether it's, uh, I don't know, Aussie Rules football or MotoGP or Formula One or any of that? Golf, maybe? Um, I mean, I don't really follow too many other sports, to be honest. Uh, like when I'm here in Australia, I follow the rugby league a little bit and used to, yeah, look up to guys like Jonathan Thurston and whatnot, um, just from the the Queensland state of origin side. Um, yeah, they were just, I'm a Queenslander and go for Queensland and they're just badass people who always just make things happen when, when they're, you know, in tough times or they're down on players or whatnot. And they, you know, got 30 seconds to make a play to win the game or whatnot. And they always, always deliver. Good. Okay. Well, Mitch, we have a selection of pictures and videos here for you now. <clears throat> And maybe okay. you can just explain to us what's happening in the picture and the videos and what they actually mean to you. Okay. okay. So the first one, uh, just tell us why are you the only one here not kitted out in this pic? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> what's going on? Um, I had just finished my motos for the day. And um, yeah, just thought, obviously, you know, two pretty cool, um, important MotoGP stars. And uh, my good friend, Sylvan, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just run over and grab a pick with them. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I was planning on staying in my gear, but they were still out motoring when I, um, when I was getting undressed. So, and it's, mate, that was, what, uh, December or November, something like that. And it was too cold to be waiting around in wet gear. So, <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, that's uh, Davizioso and uh, Danilo Petrucci. But did they actually yep. give you some uh, off-road riding tips? <laughs> no but uh they were they i was actually really surprised at how they ride um a motorbike especially on the track we were riding that day it was it wasn't like a hard pack track you know it was sandy with some deep ruts and whatnot and they were putting in some good lap times so i was really impressed yeah well you probably see dovizioso is um quite a regular visitor to mxgp anyway and he was yeah. riding with um Cairoli and those guys in junior days uh, motocross off-road um and also yeah. marco melandri who's not in that shot but um but it's always good to have them there and uh, i guess great that you got that opportunity to you know sneak yourself a pick <laughs> yeah yeah it was a good day yeah okay right next picture just tell us, uh, let's have a look. That's you on the left, obviously, but who's the dude on the right? <laughs> <laughs> G'day, Skip. <laughs> nah, um, funny story with this, um, my practice bike mechanic, uh, Michaela, he, he got me this as a gift before round one. Um, he kept asking me, oh, when's BG going to be making one for you and whatnot? And I didn't think anything of it and um yeah he showed me when we were driving to Madeley and he's like here mate um this is for you so thanks to Michaeli for that one yeah <laughs> so have you turned that into a butt patch yet then or is that just a profile well, yeah, pick we, we were gonna do that um but yeah we haven't got any more gear this year so uh <laughs> we were that that one and um we have another joke running in the team they call me the famous Aussie and I was going to get that on the on my butt patch. <laughs> cool. Brilliant. Okay, next picture. Okay, are we ready? Right, your pit bike here looks like it needs a bit of an upgrade, Mitch. Perhaps uh, <laughs> an engine and some bigger wheels would be nice. <laughs> nah, that's Marlon's bike. That's um, Eric Sorby's son's bike. So, um, yeah, I wanted to have a go on it because he's always ripping around in the pits on it <laughs> and looking like he's having a good time. So I thought I'd give it a go. Actually, uh, Eric, are you still working with him, training with him, or was that just when you were with uh, Livy's Lot last year? No, yeah, we um, we still do a little bit, uh, mainly just on race weekends because he's in France and I'm in Italy. But uh, how cool is this kid, though? And actually, very nice of him yeah. to lend uh, lend you his bike. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, because he hardly gets off it. I think he might have been having yeah. a nap or something, so that was just steal it. Okay, uh, next one. Just tell us, is this your audition for the next Superman movie? What is going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, That's I was smooth. trying to think of a good smooth. way to... Um, <laughs> You know, announced that I was right for Team Australia, and that was the best thing I could think of. But yeah, oh, um, Mama Cal ain't the best on the photography there, getting it full in <laughs> shot. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. Okay, and uh, last but not least, we have a little video for you. If you could just tell us where was this video shot? Okay. So uh, getting ready. Yeah, we got. Yeah. Um, so that was in Riola at uh, Sin Cola Truck, I believe mm. you pronounce it. Yeah, um, that was the actually first day of me riding that new bike, so um, that's why I kind of look a little bit goon trying to throw some whips on it. A so. <laughs> couple of panic revs in there as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all, all the time they were panic revs. <laughs> But when you're doing stuff like that, do you enjoy this kind of thing? Because uh, obviously this is a team shoot, part of the pre-season thing, and these images go everywhere. You know, Honda use them, whatever sponsors use them. Um, but is that a side that you actually enjoy, or is that just just want to get on and do motos? No, nah, honestly, like back in the day before I started really training properly, is I never really had a schedule. I never go out to do motos or anything like that i'd go out and do a bit of play riding and you wouldn't you wouldn't know it but i used to try and practice whips but um yeah haven't really developed that skill yet so but yeah i used to always just try and have fun on the dirt bike and just ride it until i didn't really want to ride it anymore and just pull up and park it so i definitely now with having like a schedule full time and whatnot i definitely enjoy getting days where i can go out and just enjoy throwing trying to throw some whips at least and um yeah throwing some dirt for the camera yeah any more okay. socials there yes we have uh, another one on social from facebook matthew bunnick says are you planning on racing the motocross of nations for team australia this year yeah matthew i I would be. I always plan on racing for Team Australia every year. So, um, yeah, who knows if it's going to go ahead this year, but I plan on being there. Okay. Cool. And actually, to add to that, because if I do race for Team Australia and I'm in the MX1 class, I get to run 43. So. Oh, cool. Coincidence. Yeah. yeah. So doing all Fantastic. you can then. Put on the green and gold yeah. and uh, strap yeah. on the 43. Yeah. That'd be amazing. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay, we have Ewan Fenema. What was your first bike? Um, my first bike was, yeah, my brother and I shared a JR50. So, yeah, a little Suzuki 50, and that thing went for miles until um, I definitely believe my brother flogged it a little bit more than I did, but um, <laughs> it, it lasted a long time. Okay, brilliant. Uh, Adam Winslet. What has been your longest drive to the track for racing or training? Longest okay. drive to the track for racing? I don't know about to the track, but definitely on the way home. I remember in 2018, we raced in South Australia at Murray Bridge. And my mum and I decided to, I was living in Melbourne. We had driven across to the race and then we were going to drive from there back to my place in Cairns. And uh, we did it nonstop, I think, in 36 hours. Oh, my. That's pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we, we, it was something like we left um, 5 o'clock um, Sunday afternoon and got home at like 2 or 3 a.m. Tuesday morning. Yeah, there's no need for that. <laughs> no need for that <laughs> totally unnecessary um, definitely well, would not us. do it again no, no. <laughs> uh, that's it for the social questions on Facebook thank you guys for all of those <clears throat> um, so before we go then Mitch um, when do you think you'll be heading back this way um, back to Europe to rejoin the team 
Yeah, so um, hopefully I'm going to be allowed to leave Australia from the government um, because there's obviously um, some strict rules on that. But I believe because I'm employed over there and I have a visa over there that they should be able to let me go. So as soon as I get the all clear from the doctor, the team are, gonna, are wanting me over there straight away. So um, yeah, could be early July, I'm thinking. Okay. And where are you based actually? In Italy with the team or are you more sort of central in Belgium? Yeah. No, nah, I'm with the team in Italy. Cool. And how are you finding it? Yeah, it's good. It's um, definitely a bigger bigger city than what I'm used to here in Australia. But uh, yeah, it's good. There's plenty of tracks around and good tracks. And being close to the team makes um, life a lot easier if I want to make a change or whatnot. So cool. And finally, um, do you enjoy the European way of life? Are you embracing it? The weather? Are you embracing the European way? Of, yeah, just the way uh, of life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, winter times struggles a little bit, but um, definitely sort of I struggled a little bit last year, but I've kind of made it a little bit more homely this year by bringing over some pictures and, and whatnot and um, definitely uh, hit – Definitely, um, this year has made it a lot easier because I met my girlfriend Jasmine, who lives in Paris and um, was in the same situation as me, away from family and whatnot. So now, whenever we're together over there, it kind of feels like home again. So it's um, it's really good. Cool. All right. Well, look, um, Mitch Evans, Team HRC. Thanks for joining us and being a guest on our uh, virtual studio show here on Nemix GP Facebook and. Uh, Hope the recovery goes well and, and, you know, we look forward to seeing you at a racetrack soon. Uh, Lisa, as always, thank you to you in Barcelona and to our um, production crew out there in Italy, Gabriele and Christian. So um, we'll see those guys in a week's time when we do it all again on Saturday. But don't forget, Tuesday and Thursday of this week, uh, myself and Lisa will be doing uh, Instagram Live. So I'll be on Tuesday and Lisa on Thursday and we're back with the studio show a week today. Well, that's it. Thanks for joining us. Hope you've enjoyed it and hope you've enjoyed what Mitch has had to say. It's been uh, quite uh, lighthearted and uh, quite amusing. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Mitch. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening down there, upside down, the other side of the world. And we'll see you again uh, next week. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye for now.